All right, just before lunch, I'll make sure I won't run into lunch because I'm getting hungry myself. If there's any rumbling, that's me. Um, second talk for me today, and I'll go be able to talk about it's all about to go to. Don't worry too much. All right, hi, I'm Derek again. Um, I've done this previous slide, but uh, I wrote some like extensions for PHP called Xdebug. You might have heard about that. If not, go type it into Google. Uh, but uh, what we'll be talking about here is mostly about none of the things that I've written, but mostly about PHP's internals. Uh, mo many of these things in there I have found out while writing Xdebug over the past 15 and a half years or so. Um, in these 15 years, it has changed quite a lot. Um, so I'll be looking at a, a few things and how current PHP currently handles the execution of scripts, starting all the way from it being a file on your file system to it being run-ish. Anyway, let's get going. So what we'll be talking about this um, early afternoon is about uh, different stages that happen from going from source code to execution. Um, uh, we're going to look at how PHP converts stuff, and then we have a bit of a conclusion at the end, of course. All right, so first let's have a look at the stages. Which stages happen when PHP executes a script, basically? So the first thing is that the first stage is that PHP has to parse the script. It needs to read everything that's in there and make some kind of meaning out of it. It is uh, something gets converted into tokens. But those words maybe we'll get back to in a moment. So that's the first step. The second step is then, well, from these things that it finds in your script, it needs to make a, it needs to create some meaning out of it, right? So that's a logical representation. And in PHP, it, uh, that means that those tokens, those bits of scripts, get converted into an abstract syntax tree. That is a really difficult word to say many times, so from now on I will call it AST, so that I don't stumble over my own words. Um, third step is, well, from this AST, we're now going to have crea uh, create executable code. And PHP executable code is stored in something called opcodes. Uh, what those are and how they look like, we'll get back to in a moment. Uh, but there's a term that's important to know. And then the PHP engine or the Zend engine runs this bytecode. Which means that we're PHP is actually doing something with it. But as you can see, before we get to actually running code, there's quite a few things that, that PHP does. All right, so let's have a look at the first one about parsing. Now, parsers are based on rules. Uh, how this works in PHP is basically as follows. I mean, once it opens a file, it is a, in a state called initial. And this in, in this initial state, basically anything it finds will be echo statements. I mean, that makes no sense if you think of it. But as you know, in PHP, you do not have to start with a PHP opening tag, right? I mean, you don't have to. I mean, most people will do that now, but you don't need to. PHP originally was just a simple, simple templating language. So this initial state, if you just have normal text, it gets converted into initial echo statements, although you don't see them in the code, of course. Now, the moment you get a PHP opening tag, it changes the state from this initial mode into a state called ST in scripting. We're in a scripting state. Well, in this case, of course, it will find you the function names, or the, sorry, the function keywords, uh, strings containing the function names, and all the syntax bits. Um, there's different states as well, because, for example, if PHP encounters double quotes, from that moment on, it needs to handle certain things differently, right? Like, if you're outside of double quotes, a variable assignment does do something different than what it do inside double quotes. And PHP needs to, the, the parser needs to distinguish between these cases, uh, in order to make uh, meaning out of it. And maybe a better example here is if you use now doc or here doc, the variable parsing or the parsing of things between now doc start and the end is, very is, is different than it would be from outside there because you can't call functions in it, for example. So all the stages are being switched to depending on different things that it sees in the file. Now, how the way how that happens how the definitions are done is something a little bit like, like in this example here. So the, t the, the thing between the pointy brackets, it says, is the state. Um, and then it matches with a regular expression the thing behind the state name against what is currently finding in the phone. 
So if we are in the initial state and we encounter this PHP opening tag followed by an optional space tab character or new line, then we're going to do something with the token that we just found. And in this case, what it does is well, it handles the new line. So if there's a new line, it will increase the internal line number so PHP keeps track on which line switch code happens. It switches the state, so we're switching to ST inscripting, and then we return the token, which is the T open tag. Every time it finds something, it will return a token with a name, like open tag or any of the others you can think of, uh, but no meaning is given to these tokens. Now, in order to see what it actually does, the PHP comes with a tokenizer extension. Some of you have probably have played with it, which gives it like a nice visualization of what tokens or which tokens PHP sees. Um, there's a few extensions, sorry, libraries that actually make use of these tokens. Uh, like um, PHP Code Sniffer used to look at these tokens. I don't know whether it's doing that only now um, to figure out whether you don't have like code style violations and stuff like that, right? So let's take this example from, well, it's an example that I plucked out of my side project and then rewritten, so it doesn't actually mean anything. But it's just as an overview to see how this gets converted into tokens, right? So I don't have anything before the PHP open tag, so what happens is that, well, um, it sees the, P, uh, the T open tag, stands for token open tag. Uh, and we know that the open tag is, of course, consists out of pointy brackets, question mark, PHP. Well, the next thing is white space. There's a new line in there. Uh, I have removed the new lines because that made the slide a little bit more easier to read. But the next line, of course, it, has, it says the word namespace. So the parser will say, oh, this is a namespace token. Then there's some white space. Then there's a string, and the string is the word dramio. But it doesn't know at this moment yet whether this is actually a class name. It just sees, sorry, namespace name. It only sees the keyword namespace and a string containing a value. It doesn't actually do anything it being a namespace. That happens quite a bit later. Uh, you get the semicolon, which is in there. Uh, then the next line, you get the T class. You get private and variable. They're all different tokens associated with keywords that it finds in PHP. And those names of those tokens, you'll often see coming back if you get like syntax errors, like parser errors, right? You get those back, um, including the very famous te piamin nuke that I am, this really long Hebrew word that means double, double colon. All right, so this is the tokenization. Um, um, Tokenization is a very simple thing. After those tokens are emitted by the parser, they then go through a scanner. And the scanner attaches meaning to the tokens that come through there. Again, this started, uh, the every state of the scanner starts with a specific state, which is called top statement. That is basically the start of a script as long as you are in a PHP code block. And the way how this rule set works is as follows. You have a set of names with rules associated with it. So in this case, the top statement can be a statement or a function declaration statement or a class declaration statement or a trade declaration statement. The or are by convention is placed on the first, first bit of each line. If it finds a statement, it does the action in the curly braces. In this case, it doesn't do anything. It's just an assignment. But let's have a look at the class, dec the class declaration statement, which can exist be two different things. It can be either class modifiers followed by the name of a class, followed by extends and implements and a doc block comment. That's the first state, right? So we have, it can be class modifiers followed by the name, the T string is the name of the class you get extends from the list of your extent statements. You get, sorry, I need to aim properly, implements list, which interfaces it implements. And then you have the doc comment. So you, every class, as you know, can have a doc comment associated with it, right? And th th these things are actually stored, unlike comments, class doc blocks and function doc blocks are actually stored internally in, in PHP. So the other alternative, as you see here, is just T class. There's no class modifier. So that's the only difference here. So often those rule sets are quite specific, whether it sees a class with class modifiers or without. 
Now, if we go further down this rabbit hole, you look at class modifiers, and the class modifiers is either a class modifier or class modifiers with a class modifier. So this is like a recursive statement, basically, right? And the order in which this happens is sort of required to be like this because uh, the way how scanners internally work. Scanners work by looking at the tokens up to the point where they can, where they match a rule. Uh, if they don't match a rule, it sometimes needs to backtrack. And you want to avoid the backtracking because that is, of course, not very efficient. And the way how we improve that is by having the rules in a specific order to make that less of an issue. Right, so to ignore this bit here and look at a simpler bit, the moment it sees like class modifier with class modifier, it will ac actually call a C function, which is called Zend art class modifier, to the list of class modifiers it already has. So for each of these action blocks between the curly braces, that gets converted into C code that is being run when the, when the script is being parsed. Uh, and they can get quite complicated, as you, as you imagine. Of course, if you look at the class modifiers themselves, you have abstract and final, right? So which makes sense if you look at it. So the scanner actually allows you, interestingly, to use final, 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 abstract, final, abstract class, if you really want to do that. Uh, that gets thrown out later, but the scanner allows you to do these things, because this now as you can see, there's no limitation in there. Actually, I haven't tried where you can make a final, final class. Somebody on a laptop should try that for the fun of it. Um, anyway, those are, this is how the scanners work. What you get out of these scanners is uh, this AST, this abstract syntax tree. In some places you can already see, it. I know it falls off the slide, but for example, if it sees a class name here, it calls a function zend AST create declaration. And then as an option to this function, uh, so an argument is called zend AST class, which basically means create a node in the tree that represents a class definition. So it constructs the scanner, gives meaning to the tokens, and it constructs this AST through the rule sets. If you really want to look at how this works, I mean, the scanner code isn't pure C. It gets converted into C. This is an enormously big file. It is probably tens of thousands of li lines long, and um, nobody would ever write that on their own. It's way too complicated to do. Uh, all those things that you find in the rules, like things like num3, which means the third variable, gets converted into like a really complicated thing between two array elements and stuff like that. Not something that any would ever have to write unless there's a bug in the scanner generator code, which is really not our problem. Um, so yeah, out of this you get this AST. Nice abstract. And an abstract syntax tree basically only describes the structure of your script as uh, tokenized by the tokenizer, and analyzed by the scanner. And the state after you get is this tree. Um, so it describes the structure of the parsed script. Each node is usually a language construct or something that makes up a language construct. Uh, the nested structures are represented through a tree. It's called an AST for a reason. Um, not all the original information is kept now. Like all the comments that may, that don't, uh, all the comments that are not doc blocks have been stripped out by now. It's no longer important. Sorry, it gets better like this. Yeah, a bit echoey. Sorry, it was a bit e echoey for me. Is this still loud enough in the back as well? Yeah, finger. Okay, good. So yeah, not all this information is being kept. Um, it is interesting that just like the scanner and the tokenizer, you can visualize this AST with an extension. It's called PHP AST. It is written by Nikita Popov. He's one of the developers on the Zend engine. And uh, this allows you to visualize them. And it's also interesting to, if you look at this AST, you can actually decide sometimes whether some parts of the code can't be run, or some optimizations can be done on this AC, or other kinds of transformations. Like if people are interested in like active, sorry, this is not called active oriented. How is the word for this? Sorry, AOP. I don't know, sorry, I forgot what the acronym is. It allows you to, to insert all the bits of code before and after functions run. This is something you could potentially inject into the AST. With the exception is that currently you can't do that from user land yet. I mean, only extensions can potentially change this AST, and I don't actually think they exist. 
So although optimizations are probably possible in ASD, they have in PHP not been done. Optimizations in PHP happen later. And we'll get back to that in a moment. All right, so if you look at what this extension outputs, uh, it up outputs an enormously big object nested array structure. It's very difficult to see what it does. Luckily, the extension comes with an extra PHP library that reads this and then emits it in a nice way. And then it makes it look something like this. So the top of your AST is a statement list. A statement list, in this case, apparently it has a constant definition here. And then it has a class. AST class says this is a node representing a class declaration. Well, you, what, do, what does a class have, right? It has a name. The name of this class is whiskey. What does it extend? Well, it doesn't extend anything. Uh, hence, you get the extends null. Implements null. Doesn't implement anything either. And then, of course, the class, the constants of a class, is a statement list again. And this statement list then contains your properties. In this case, we have one called name. Uh, we have a method. In this case, it's a constructor. A constructor has flags, like it's a of course, constructors are usually public, but it makes sense to make private constructors as well sometimes, right? So those are recorded in here. Um, there's the, the arguments or the parameters to the constructor is a parameter list. In this case, there's one argument, which is, as you can see, the name of this argument is name. Perhaps not the best example to pick as a variable here, but because uh, the value and the key are the same. anyway. Uh, it doesn't use anything, so it's not a um, it's not a generator method. And then, of course, inside the constructor, you have a list of statements again, right? Like you have here. So the statement list here, you have an assignment, and it says an assignment of a property. Actually, let me show you that in a little bit of an easy way because I nicely color coded it, and it even works on this projector, which is pretty good. So if you convert like this little constructor code that I have here into this section of the AST you can sort of match the different things that you find in the code with what it looks like in the AST. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit more trickier to see. I've already done the first line, so I'll just look at the assignment now. So the statement here, this is the statement, re represents what this does, right? So it basically says it's an assignment uh, statement, and an assignment in PHP has a left-hand value and a right-hand value. The left-hand is usually the name of a variable or a property, like in this case, and the right-hand side is an expression. In this case, the expression is very simple. It is a simple variable with a name, which you can see coming back here. So the expression basically is a variable with a name. That, that's what this is. On the other side, we have a property. So that's a bit more complicated because a property has an expression, which is the left side of the property evaluation, which is in this case, this as a variable. And then the property name on this is name. You can see that you get a very big tree structure out of this, right? Which sometimes can be a bit tricky to see. But everything in the original script will be represented in this AST, except for the comments and the white space that's being stripped out. At this moment, white space is no longer relevant. Um, so let's have a look at, um, at some other things. So after the AST has been generated, from there, PHP generates bytecode that can then be run in the executor. We call them opcodes. In PHP, every function, every method, every main body of a script is represented by opcodes, and multiple opcodes form an op array. So an op array is basically a description in bytecode of a function, a method, or a main body of your script. And the Zend engine executes each opcode in turn like assembly would do, really. It's very similar to that, and you'll see that in the next slide if you're familiar with assembly. There's a bunch of different extensions that can actually visualize that. Uh, there's one that is part of opcache. There's one that is part of PHPDBG. Um, and there's one that is done in VLD, which is an extension I wrote a long, long time ago, uh, just to visualize them. I picked the latter because I know that best, so it makes it easy for me to explain how this works. All right, so let's have a look at how this gets converted, right? So we have the same method as before. And you can see the tree structure is kind of complicated. I mean, lots of things happening there. But if you look at the operay, it is a linear list of things to do. There's no tree structure or anything in there. So if you want to do anything like that, you have to do go-tos, which we'll show you in the next line. However, just to see what a constructor does here, 
the arguments or all the variables used inside a method or a function, they show up in a list called compiled vars. This is, Peach, this is something that came in PHP 5.3. Basically made sure that every variable that is used is being represented by number in the opcodes. Uh, before PHP 5.3, that wouldn't be done, and every time PHP would have to do something with a variable, it would have to look this up in a table called a symbol table to figure out the data that belongs to this variable name. With uh, PHP 5.3 later, there are now compiled variables that are now just a number. They are numbered directly into an index array, which is much faster than having to have to look up the variable name in the symbol table. There's a good optimization there. Uh, one of the big optimizations, PHP 5.3. So you get to compiled variables, that's how they're called. Now then we look at the opcodes, there's seven generated, XNOP. X stands for extended. That is something that uh, debuggers and things will generate to make it easier to do uh, single step debugging. Uh, XNOOP stands for no operation. Doesn't actually do anything. It's basically wasting space here. Um, you get receive, or RECV, which means receive a argument that is being passed to the function into the variable that we, we have given the opcode. So the receives here says exclamation mark zero, and if you look that up in the table, it says that is the name argument. So basically this line says, accept into the function, into this variable, the value that is being passed to the function, uh, and assign that to the name variable. Then you get X statements. That is the places where debuggers could pause. So after every statement, PHP will generate this X statement so that debuggers can stop, so you get to do the single step in. Um, assign OB OBJ is an opcode that assigns a value to a property. Now, it, I need to mention that in PHP, each of these opcodes can have one return value and two operands. Now, if you look at how would I assign something to a property, that is trickier, right? Because you have the name of your uh, object, you have the name of your property, and you have the value to associate with it. That is three operands. You can't do that in PHP. You can only have two. So how do you get around that? Well, by inventing this extra opcode called opdata that doesn't do anything, besides providing extra information to the opcode that precedes it. However, of course, if you see assign OBJ, where is the variable representing the object? It's not there. It's not there because this is the default. So it doesn't have to be encoded, an odd optimization that, that came in PHP 5 somewhere. So though you only see two operands being used, internally it's actually three. So, but this is implied, so it doesn't show up. So this, these two opcodes basically say assign the value of what is stored in exclamation mark zero, which is the name variable, to the property name. So what this line basically says, or these two lines basically say, this name equals name. Simple, right? Then we have the other x statement and then we have a return at the end. Every function in PHP or method always get a return statement at the end of a function, even if you haven't included it yourself in script. It always going to be returned null. This is something that's like, oh, likely going to be changed in PHP 7.2 or perhaps 7.3. I'm not quite sure that it's made into 7.2. Again, an optimization of like these. All right, so now let's look at the jumps. Uh, don't do this. This is so long that we was obviously level. And I've seen people do this, and it's crazy. I did not take this one. All right, so I mentioned already that this AST is a big nested tree structure of representing code. I've also mentioned that the opcodes in an operate are a linear list. For instance, it's an array. It's not a tree structure anymore. So in order to make decisions, to have decision points, there needs to be a way to skip certain parts of the operate and go to other parts of the operate. And with my phrase, you can already hear the word go to in there, right? So there needs to be some kind of a go to in here. In PHP, they're called jump instructions, and there are several of them. As an example here, what I'm doing is 
if A equals 42, then we echo this string to lie the universe network. Um, in the AST, it looks like this, right? I mean, it's kind of complicated. It starts with this if node, the if construct, and if uh, has elements in it. The elements to if are your condition and a list of statements. And the condition of score, of course, here is this binary is equal operation comparing the variable A to the value 42. So that's, that's encoded in the conditional part of it. And then you get the states from this, which is all the things that are being executed inside the if statement. In which case, this is a very simple echo. Now, because there is a decision point here, the if statement is a decision point, you always see those coming back as jump instructions. So if we walk down the opcos from start to bottom, so first we get this x statement, and we put debuggers. Then we get is equal. So what it does here, it compares the value that is stored in exclamation mark zero, which as you can see is A here, compares that to 42. This comparison, the return value of this, it stores in this tilde one thing. Tilde means it's a temporary variable. It is only going to be used a little bit. And not representing an actual variable in your code. It's an internal way of representing things. And then the next all code, it compares the Boolean value in here. Uh, and it has an instruction for this. This stands for jump zero. So it says, if the result, result of the previous operation that put the result in tilde one is zero, then we jump to all code number five. And all code number five is after the echo part. And so we turn to it. It's the end of the function here. So what this says is, well, we compare this, and if it, if it does not match, then we jump to uh, opco 5. If it doesn't match, then it just executes the next opco line, which in this case is X statement, so that it can pause before we uh, before PHP runs the echo statement. And at the end here, it just drops down like it would have jumped over. So this is what you go to this, right? Every decision in PHP is done in a similar way to this, but there are more jump instructions. All right, so an if and an else. Um, in this case, um, the, um, the AST will now have multiple if statements. So it has an if statement with a condition for the first if, and the else is represented as an if element without a condition. So just if nothing else happens. And of course, each of those has statements again. Now, when I run this, the first bit is the same, right? We compare the value of that is stored in A to pi. Uh, if it doesn't match, we, um, we jump to opcode number 6, which is here, which is this x statement here, and you see the echo for squares. Uh, if it doesn't match, sorry, if it matches, it runs the x statement and the echo and echo circles, but of course you don't want it to run the other echo statement, right? Because otherwise it says both circles and squares. It's like you forget a break clause in a switch case statement. I mean, all of you have probably done that before, I certainly have. So you need to hold our jump instructions to make sure that you jump over the else statement. And this is a jump instruction without a letter behind it, but which makes it an unconditional jump, which is always jump to the operand that is specified, and that is, of course, number eight in this case. It makes you jump to the end of the function here. Does that make sense? I haven't lost too many people yet. All right, well, ifs are simple enough, but then, of course, we have loops or rings, as I showed you. Um, let's have a look at the simple for statement. So a for statement is a little bit more complicated than the AST because it has a condition. It, it, sorry, it has an initialization condition, initializing the variables. In this case, we're initializing uh, i to 0. Then we have a condition, comparing i, it needs to be smaller than 42. And then at the end, we have a loop condition, or a loop expression, or this of expressions really um, that needs to be run, of course, at the end of every loop. That's how the first statement works. And then you have the echo in the middle. Now, once PHP generates opcodes from this, it isn't exactly in the same order anymore as it used to be. As you can see, uh, with a color code, sort of, I know that's difficult to see here. Like the red statement is your initialization condition, which in the operates still shows up first. 
But instead of them having a condition and a loop, what you actually see uh, in your code, you actually see the statements that are being put in the form first. So that's this bit here, like the echo, right? Happens on line four. So you see one, two, uh, it's line three. I mean, I probably removed one of the lines of the script. So remove one from those numbers here. So yeah, it, it first of all, it does the assignment, that's the initialization structure, right? And then it does a jump. And where does it jump to? It jumps to number six. And remember, six, six is the condition uh, to make sure that the for, you only echo the statements in the for loop once the condition still holds true. So this is smaller than, it compares it for 42, it does this x statement, and then it just jump not zero, meaning that if the condition is true, uh, we're going to jump to, what is number? Number three. And if you look at number three here, that is then the echo. Um, after the echo, it then runs to pre-increment, which is on line two again, or which is the one here. So you see that it gets reordered a little bit, right? And this is exactly, if you would rewrite a for statement yourself with go to statements, which you should never do, unless you want to play with this for a little bit, like I've done on this slide, it makes perfect sense again. So if you would rewrite a for loop in a, in a most optimal way with go-tos instead of having the for, if, if, if you think for does not exist in PHP anymore, um, it looks like this, right? In exactly the same way as it would be represented in the operate. So you first get your initialization, uh, you have your echo statements, you have the, the post loop increment, and then you have the condition. And when you follow the, the instructions in the, in the middle section of the slide, well, you see that after the initialization done is made, we jump to the condition. If the condition holds true, we jump to statement, which then executes um, the echo statement and increases i by one. And then it does the condition again. It is basically done in such a way that the condition is always checked. That's why you have the initial jump to the condition. But after that, it loops easily through without having any other jump instructions, of course, until the condition doesn't hold true anymore. If you wouldn't do it this way, you end up having more jump instructions, which makes things slower. So this is sort of an optimization that, from what I know, has always been in PHP. Uh, for loops, while loops, similar thing. While loops, the order of the while loops gets also rewritten in a very similar way. Of course, in a while loop, the conditions is done in a different place, but this is very similar to what a for loop does, right? I mean, you can rewrite every for loop into a while loop if you really want to do that. I don't think you should, but you can. Similar thing with a do while loop. It's a variation on, on, on while again. again if you look at this, I will show, the slides will be available later. You can have a look at this and go through this yourself to figure out whether it makes sense. But it's again a very similar thing. The tricky bits come when you get to things like for each. So for each is very much more complicated um, because what a for each has to do is when it starts looping over an array, um, it needs to keep an internal pointer. And this internal pointer needs to be allocated. So what happens here? Let's go over it. So we have the initial assignment, A equals A array of two elements, which got represented by this one opcode here. This opcode number one. This says assign to the variable A an array of constant values, uh, which PHP actually uh, does for you. It, it, it does that. Uh, previous version of PHP would actually allocate an array and then add each element to it one by one. PHP 7 doesn't do that anymore. It just creates this one structure right away, making things go faster again. Uh, we get this X statement on line two, uh, sorry, on opcode number three in line two, so that we can pause just before the for loop. But then in the for loop, it gets complicated. So it does an FE reset R that basically says, allocate a new pointer to go over the array for reading. The R stands for reading at the end. So this this basically allocates this pointer and stores um, a reference to this pointer in dollar sign four, which is a different type of temporary variable in PHP. So there's the tilde and the dollar. They're both temporary, but they're slightly different handle, handled. Um, but it has a quick 
quick cut in here. So it sees that if the array exactly has no elements, it instantly jumps to opcode 11, which is then, it frees the pointer and then returns from the function. So there's a shortcut in here. Um, then on line four, you have the fu fetch. The fu fetch is a way of fetching the, uh, what is it, the value, do you say that right? Yeah, the value of, um, of the next element in the, in the array. So the operands to, to this are uh, the pointer being created in the previous one. It is uh, the variable that you want to store the, the value of the array element in. And then if this doesn't work, there's a third operand of a jump to instruction 11. Does that make sense? I see a hand being raised here. Right, there can only be a maximum of two operands. True, most of the time. Uh, PHP is very special in this regard, right? Uh, this extra operand isn't actually an operand. It is something we call an extended value. And in most cases, they just provide flags to, uh, like little tweaky flags to opcodes to run. But in some cases, like this one, it actually encodes an additional number um, which isn't actually stored as a operand. It is stored as this extended value. But some opcodes associate these, these extended values with specific meanings. And in this case, fe fetch r, uh, the meaning that this opcode associates with it is a jump instruction. PHP, what can I say? And there's way more of these things in PHP. Uh, I don't have the time to talk about all of them, although that would be quite interesting. Um, on line five, you can get another assignment, and this is the assignment of the key to the key variable. If you do a for each with A as value and you don't have the key part of it, that line isn't being used. Uh, so that uh, makes, yeah. I mean, if you don't have to do work, then why put it in, right? That's how it works. And then, of course, you get your statements, and then you get the jump instruction. To go back to the fe fetch r to loop to go over the next element in your array and then store the next value. Now, for each is difficult here because it needs to uh, allocate this pointer to loop over your array as well as it needs to free it. Now, this is one of the reasons why the goto construct in PHP is not allowed to jump into loops. Because what would happen if you would jump into the for each loop here and the pointer hasn't been allocated? Well, if a pointer isn't allocated, you can't really incremented, right, because there's no initialization, and you certainly can't free it at the end of the loop. Because this is something that's, well, it is possible to be solved, but makes things so complicated, addition was made that uh, the go-to keyword in PHP itself has been restricted to only jump outside of loops and if statements and, and not between functions. So this is one of the reasons why that is. Uh, things get more complicated if you have more loops, more if statements, and nested if statements and else clauses and things like that. It gets very complicated, sort of like this. And if you've seen Primer, you, you probably know what is the, the joke behind this. All right, so, but there are some ways of actually visualizing this. I, I will not go through the, the, the opcodes in here because uh, I'll leave it as some homework for you if you want to. Um, but it's good to see that these representations can also be represented in tree structures and that is something that VLD allows you to do. It can create, create those graphs to represent the looping and jumping structure in your code. And it lists in there uh, the, the numbers of the opcodes and also the line numbers on which these things happen. Um, if you go through the code and follow the graph, you'll probably make sense of it. Uh, but as I said, I don't have enough time to go through this line by line in this case. Um, this is, of course, not very complicated because there's only three decision, sorry, three decision points, right? There's the for each, which is one. There's the first if, that is the second one. And you get the third if, which is your third decision po point. Anytime you make a decision point, you get twice as many arrows. Because from a decision point, you can either go left or right. So every decision point, every if statement creates, duplicates the amount of different possibilities you have to follow the graph. That is something you need to remember for some slides in the future. All right, so let's have a look at that code. 
I mean, people write stupid code sometimes, right? I mean, sometimes an accident, sometimes it's done on purpose, uh, like what we have here. So we compare A to 42, we echo 40, then we return, and then we echo 2. Of course, the echo, echo 2 line will never, ever be executed, because we have a return statement before that. It's a similar thing if you have a, a throwing exception before returning, right? It makes no sense. Or you have a return statement and then a break statement. Also makes no sense to have. And VLD actually has functionality in there that is also being used in XDBook to actually go through this and mark all the bits of your code that can't be executed. Which in this case, the echo, it marks that with a star saying this can't be executed. Interestingly, PHP 7.2 um, will do this on its own. If you have opcache enabled in PHP, in some very specific cases, it recognizes and actually eliminates the code that you cannot run from the opcodes that it stores in its cache. Because this is cache, this decision, this optimization only has to be done once, making that a worthwhile thing to do. The PHP engine itself doesn't remove these things because going through all the paths is sort of expensive. And if you don't have a cache, it means you have to do this in every time the script is being run. So this kind of optimization only really makes sense in OP cache. This is a very simple dead code analysis. PHP 7.2 uh, has a little bit more than this, uh, but some research has indicated that for, uh, this is something that PHP can expand on in such a way that in the 7.3, it will be very clever figuring out which variables are being used, where they are used. Uh, it can detect whether, uh, which is actually true in 7.2 as well. If you set A to 42 and the next line you set A to 43, it just eliminates the first line because, of course, it's a useless line of code. And more and more of that is happening in PHP 7.2, and even more of that is going to be happening in 7.3, uh, speeding up PHP. It will, it will speed up really crappy code better than good, well-written code, which is kind of funny, of course. But what this does, it finds all your unreachable opcodes, which XDebug uses for code coverage, so it can tell you on which lines there's not executable code or code that shows up in PHP but can never be reached and things like that. That all comes from following all the different arrows and paths to see which of those opcodes can actually be hit by following all the jumps, all the different directions. This then extends into branch analysis. So from this little example that I have here, if we look at the if then else function, the if then else function accepts two arguments, A and B. If A equals true, it says A is hit. If B equals true or evaluates it true, it echoes B equals hit, right? If we look at that in a graph, it looks like this. So we have the start of the function, we have the opcodes, which is the if statement, and you can either go left, like the if statement actually was true, then this bit echo, does the echo. If it wasn't true, it jumps to the next one. Here's the second if. If it is true, it echoes B hit, otherwise it jumps over that, and then it leaves the function. So if you look at this, how many different paths do you have through this function? How many possibilities do you have? Four, that's the right number, right? The which makes sense because if you have two decision uh, points, which is if and if, every time you have a decision point, it duplicates the amount of paths you have through a function. So in this case, two decision points means one times two times two, which means four. So you have four paths. Um, however, I can write code, uh, a unit test that can cover my whole test case by only running the test twice. So let's have a look at this. A PHP code coverage has built-in functionality that you don't have to use at PHP unit if you want to just play with things. Um, so that's what I've done here. So I have my little script here, if then else. It's not particularly useful function, of course, but. Uh, uh, yeah, when you load PHP code coverage, you start a code coverage test, and I call my test case by specifying true and false. And in the second test case, I specify false and true. Which, if you look at it, if you generate a code coverage report, you get this right. Uh, because all the lines of my code have been touched. But this isn't the full story, right? Because although I've hit every line in my code, I haven't tested the whole code, because I haven't tested whether A and B are both true or A and B are both false. Those are cases I haven't tested. So I haven't tested my code fully, even though code coverage says I have done so. So this code coverage reports usually lie quite significantly. 
Yeah. So um, Sebastian asked me many years ago uh, to maybe you can do something about that. And this is something that I've been introduced in XDBIG 2.3, which is several versions ago. So it now has this XDBIG CC branch check magic source in there, which will actually follow all of this and go through your code and figure out which branches are being hit and which paths are being hit. Um, the output of it is currently something like this. So from the if then else thing, there's five branches. There's the one that is the if statement, the one that is the echo, the second if statement, the second bit with the echo, and then at the end, the returns may leaving the function. So you have five branches here. And those five branches following four paths. Each where A is false and B is false, where A is true and B is false, and the other two as well. So those are the four paths that are being represented here, right? The index here is, is the opcode number, is the number of opcodes in the operator. Um, and yeah, the output of that is clearly what you can see is that, well, we have hit all the branches, because you can see that here it hits. But if you look at the paths, it hasn't done the first one, which is both A and B being true or both A and B being false. So it will now tell you that I've only covered two out of the four paths possible. Um, well, how do you visualize this? Well, my first attempt on that was doing it something like this. So for every possible path, I make a, a color representing that path. So the red path is A is true and B is true. Uh, the purple one is A is false and B is false, and the other two, the, the green and um, blue, which I realized is very difficult to see in this projector, are for other paths. So a dashed line means we haven't done the paths. A solid line means we have followed that path. And that's, that works quite well right now in this case, with four possible paths. Now, how often do you only have two if statements in a function? I've seen functions that have maybe 10 or maybe 20 different if statements, right? And every time you have this decision point, an if statement, you duplicate the amount of paths that you can have. So with 10 if statements or 10 loops, you end up having 1,024 possible paths, which makes it very difficult to visualize in a different color because you're not going to be able to see all the different colors, right? So the visualization aspect of this is a very difficult thing to solve. And as far as I know, it hasn't been solved yet. So you don't see this in, in PHP code coverage yet, although Rumors are that people are now working on it. The other problem with this is that analyzing the paths and branches takes up quite some time. It is not something that is fast. It takes quite some time, and doing this for all of your code, you're not going to have a good time. Or unless you like going out for dinner, making tea, while your, while your single test runs kind of thing, right? It takes a long time. Unfortunately, in Xdebug currently, there's no way of saying which bits of your code you do want to run this for and which other bits you don't want to run this for. So right now, if you want to do this with PHP Union and PHP code code and you turn in this flag, it will be 10, 20 times slower than your tests currently already run. And I realize turning on code coverage while running your test slows it down quite significantly. So what I'm adding to, to Xdebug 2.6 is a way of filtering, uh, filtering it out. So you can say, I only want to do the code coverage for these specific directories, so I get to exclude my vendor directory. I get to exclude PHP unit running itself. And by doing that, would make this a lot more usable. But the visualization aspect still needs to be solved in some way, yeah. which is not my thing. All right, a recap. What have we spoken about today? We have spoken about the different stages. Uh, we go from codes to tokens. We go from the tokens with the scanner to parsing. That then goes to this ab abstract syntax tree, this tree structure describing uh, the internals of, uh, of a function or a file, bait really. That's, that's converted to bytecodes, all the operates. We've had a quick look at all the looping structures being converted to loops. We've had a look at a bit of code analysis for pun and profit. Uh, the extensions that I've used here are, vi uh, are all open source. Um, I've provided a link here. Uh, they're also linked from the slides from the link at the end of the presentation. But that's what I had about to talk about today. I'm sure there are some questions. If you have them, let me know. But I have to throw this box at you, which is fun for me. Okay, where was the hand? It's okay, I'm good with darts. Oh, that's pretty spot on, wasn't it? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> example of the dead code. It's, uh, you need to speak oh. into the microphone. Uh, 
Okay. In the example of the dead code, uh, you had there uh, two returns, and one of them was returning like null and in the opcodes, and the second one was returning one. Is there a difference between returning with return and returning by just going to the oh. end of the script? Yes. So there is the returns are different. So at the end of every file, PHP will include a return one. Which means that if you would include a file, you can check for that. So you can do if include file, you know for sure that helps, that, that worked. For functions and methods, it adds a return null at the end. That's how it works. Uh, has been there for a long time. So that's the difference. The return one happens at the end of a file. The return null is at the end of a method or a function. Any further questions? Now you get to throw. <laughs> Don't hit people in the face. <laughs> <coughs> I've got a question regarding yeah. xdebug. Yeah. When do we get time travel debugging? Oh, when do you get time tra travel debugging? Well, the, the thing is I started doing that. Time travel debugging allows you to go back in time as well when you're doing debugging, which is a really nice thing to have. I started working on that and then PHP 7 happened, which meant I had to rewrite xdebug. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that made it very difficult. Then for a long time I was supporting PHP 5.6 so five, 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 six, and seven, making it also very complicated to do. Uh, from the next release of XDebug 2.6, which will be coming out with PHP 7.2, I've dropped all of PHP 5, making the code base quite a lot leaner and easier again. And I finally think I've tracked down most of the bugs that were part of XDebug for PHP 7. So I'm now getting to the point where I can add new features again. And as part of that, I do want to go back to the time travel debugging. But I can't promise you when that will happen, but it's definitely something I do want to do because I think it's amazing to have. I was, I, apparently some more people find it interesting. Okay, throw it backwards. Uh, okay, I have a question about the, uh, I think you call it the extended value, the yes. thing that's supposed to overcome the limitation of having only two operands for a single opcode. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a slide before, you presented a different way of overcoming that limitation yeah. by using the other opcode that serves as providing data. Yes. Uh, what's the difference and why do we have to? Okay, so the, the extended value can only be a single number. It cannot be anything more complicated. It cannot describe necessarily a variable or things like that. The other two operands, they're much more rich today and code a lot more things than just a single number. So you can't always do that, but better for each because it's just a jump number, it can be put in extended value. Okay, so why not uh, use the uh, richer implementation, the one with the next opcode mm -hmm. for everything? Why have the second one? The extra second one takes up extra space, right? So you don't want to use that in the cases where you can avoid it. Okay, so it's a performance consideration. Sorry? A performance consideration. It's a performance consideration, yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, why xdebug doesn't stop on the uh, method names? It's like when you come from C and have experience with DDD and things like that, you you expect that when you put a breakpoint in the method name, it will stop when it, when it enters. And I saw in the opcodes that there is something in the method names. So... <sighs> xdebug can stop on entering a function and it by default it will always stop on the first line and function that has code on it right right from but what i re remember from c it does that as well it doesn't stop on the on on the on the line that defines the function itself so i don't think there's a difference there so you say that when you put a breakpoint on the line with declare with the function name it should stop inside no, it won't, because PHP has already optimized that bit out, so that it gets turned into this no opcode. However, that does not mean that xdebug can't stop on there. You can actually set breakpoints on function entry. However, IDEs don't always implement the, the user interface for it, but it is definitely possible to do. And it is definitely possible for things like PHP unit, uh, sorry, not PHP unit, um, PHP storm, because it knows where the declarations of your code are, that if you set a breakpoint click on, a, on the first line, it should quite easy be able to determine um, or set a breakpoint on function entry. And when you do that, then xdebug will stop on the first line in your function. 
I don't think uh, PHP Storm implements that sp specific thing, but it could do that if it wanted to. So, Xdebug sometimes supports more. D oh, that's not useful. You need to use my username and password to see more things. There we go. Um, so yeah, um, ID Xdebug sometimes supports more debugging features than PHP Storm does, or other IDs are even worse with it. To be fair, so yeah, there are some possibilities for improvement there. I would suggest you actually send it in as a feature request for PHP Storm. Yeah. If you find that interesting, I'll say. Anything else? Yeah, there's one right there. Ooh. Uh, we've got now uh, code coverage for branches. Do mm -hmm. we get code coverage for expressions like A and B and C? Okay, so <laughs> code coverage for expressions would be really nice to have. But PHP does not keep uh, column positions the moment it starts doing, uh, when it converts from the tokens uh, with the scanner rules, it, the only thing it keeps is line numbers. And it doesn't keep the column numbers. So I can't do expression or coverage that way. It also makes it really difficult to link, Al although you technically can probably go back from the jump instructions to how the expression originally would look like, but this is a very difficult thing to do to link that with the exact bits uh, that would make up that line in your code. So it's a very difficult thing to do. PHP doesn't provide enough information for me to, to be better with that. So I would like that, but it also takes up a lot more space, right? Because you need to start column numbers for every instructions as well as line numbers. So this is a memory that uses more memory in that case. So. All right. I don't think I can do any more questions because they've been waving at me with the end. I'm going to walk to lunch and I'm more than happy to talk about this for the rest of the afternoon. Come and find me. I'll be around either here or in the lobby. I just have one more slide to show, which is important. Important slide because it has a QR code on it and everybody loves QR codes. Um, there's a link to join in where I will uh, add a link to the slides too. It's um, something you can then find the slides that also has a list of resources for all the different extensions I've been using. And you get to give me feedback for this presentation, which I'm very interested in. I'd like to, like to know what you think of this, do you think it was useful, what things can I improve on, and so on and so on. So besides that, thank you very much, and enjoy lunch, I would say. Thank you.